Nice to be here and uh, thank everyone for turning up to listen to the talk. Um, this um, paper is uh, an outcome of a, some work I did uh, for the, on, on the social sector in the Western Balkans for the European Commission a few years ago and for the um, a subsequent piece of work for the Japanese aid agency which enabled me to visit Kosovo uh, three years ago, I think, it was now in Albania and Bosnia, and uh, interview people and, and visit institutions and so on. Um, and uh, the, uh, the World Bank has been very active in this field as well, and they've been doing a lot of work on uh, household surveys, looking at the picture of the patterns of poverty and the in impact of different social uh, assistance mechanisms on reducing poverty in the region and the proposal, the main proposal they're coming out with is the idea that um, there are some social assistance programs in place but the coverage of those systems is, is, is rather low. So on the other hand the targeting of them is quite good so they're proposing to that the, the future for social welfare should, in the region should be based on scaling up those social assistance programs. Uh, so it would be a social safety net based on means testing, which is the sort of system which was used widely in the UK and other European countries during the Great Depression. You know, you've got little budget capacity, so you should uh, you should use it in the most effective way to target the poorest and, and try to sort of focus on being as efficient as possible in the distribution of the funds because the, in an age of austerity there's, there are not that many funds available. And uh, so this paper is actually looking at, at that and, and trying to think about well, what, are the, um, what do we know about social welfare systems and the, uh, the way that the those policies are developed and as soon as you start thinking about that you start thinking about the, the politics of social welfare and what is actually driving the development of any particular social welfare regime and it becomes immediately apparent that the you know, various factors have to be in place it's all very well saying in theory that uh, this type of approach might be efficient but in practice is it going to what are the, which political forces are going to uh, introduce it or be behind it and my argument is that in the western balkans there aren't any political forces which are you can find that would be behind such a policy and that such a policy actually is is subject to political constraints uh, which make it infeasible so you have to think about alternatives and that's uh, so, uh, the, um, the outline of the paper is um, as follows, uh, the, um, uh, first of all, I'm going to look at what we've been elaborating on the said so far, on the drivers of the welfare state in, in general, um, and look at the some of the literature on welfare state regimes, I think this will be picked up in, possibly in the following papers. Um, and a little bit of history about the uh, welfare state in social, socialism and in former Yugoslavia. We heard yesterday that history is important and I agree with that. I think it's important to look at the origins of institutions and you know, we're thinking uh, about um, countries in, in transition still and transition is all about institutional change, change and in, with a few rare exceptions, perhaps uh, Kosovo might be one of them, institutional change doesn't usually come out of the blue, it usually comes as a process of evolution. Uh, and then I'll be looking at reform, the drivers of reform and the constraints to the reform, um, the question of path dependence, uh, looking briefly at the outcomes in the region and some policy conclusions. So, um, okay, what are, the, what are the drivers of the, uh, the welfare state? Well, 
What I'm going to argue is basically that in, if you look at the welfare state you know, development in the, in the West, the, the basic long-run sort of factors which brought it about were the process of industrialization and the process of the extension of the franchise to new social groups, women in particular in Britain in the early 20th century and, and the general spread of the franchise. So the issue of democratization comes into play. Okay, well various explanations uh, have been proposed to explain the growth of the welfare state. Um, the industrialism thesis grounded uh, the development of the welfare state in the new industrial societies which emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries in the West. Industrial development undermined previous social relations and social capital based on the family and the local community. And industrial workers who migrated from rural communities to anonymous industrial cities became alienated from their communities and lacked social security in the face of new social risks such as unemployment and sickness. This provided a reason for a justification for the state to step in to provide social assistance to workers who had fallen on hard times so as to preserve the quality of the labour force during periods of cyclical downturns. And this rationale implied, applied both to the advanced capitalist countries of the West as well as to the industrialising socialist economies behind the Iron Curtain. So the welfare state emerged both in capitalist countries and in the socialist countries. Also, uh, in the West, the spreading of electoral franchise and the widening of democracy changed the political culture in the advanced economies and contributed to the spread of the welfare state. New social groups were able to influence the redistribution of income and wealth through political representation. Democratization led to the growth of political support for social transfers to lower income groups such as pensioners, the disabled, the sick and lone parents. A general political imperative for greater equality emerged alongside support for measures to reduce extreme poverty and thus correct the inequalizing and impoverishing tendencies of the institutions of market-based capitalism, especially in its more liberal form. So uh, this is... Uh, Obviously, there's been a big uh, academic literature investigating the properties of these welfare states. And the, uh, one of the main uh, originators of the literature on welfare state regimes was um, Gosper Esping Anderson, who in 1990 wrote a classical book called Three Worlds of Welfare, where he identified three ideal type models of the welfare state. The Scandinavian model, the Anglo-Saxon model, and the continental European model. And explain the variety of welfare regimes on the basis of both historical path dependency is the first factor, meaning that uh, welfare states don't change very quickly over time, and they tend to have a basis in what was their previous, what, what has historically emerged. And secondly, on the basis of political coalition building, in which alliances between different social groups are a key determining variable. The political factor was seen as crucial in explaining variation in welfare regimes, some of which were supported by political alliances between the workers' movement and the middle class, others by alliances between workers and peasants. Both have provided the basis for progressive social reforms of different types. And the... Uh, oh, I won't go into the specifics of it, but the Scandinavian model is uh, based on rather universal flat rate benefits su supplemented by a, s a second tier of earnings related social insurance schemes which supported middle class standards. The continental European corporatist model was shaped by middle class interests, but in a rather different way. It provided occupationally segregated social insurance linked to employment status with the aim of ensuring middle class participation and support for welfare reform. And this is a, a key theme, I think. The, in both of these cases, the idea that the, the middle class are benefiting from the social welfare regime, social welfare state, 
and they are, they are brought in to the social transfers involved because they are going to benefit from it. And because in this corporatist model with social insurance, the, the middle classes benefit more than the poorer classes because the benefits are related to in previous income in employment, then they have an interest in supporting reforms which introduce this type of model. So the middle class uh, support for that is crucial. Um, on the other hand, the, um, the Anglo-Saxon welfare state was quite different because it didn't try to buy, buy in the middle classes. It had its two, two distinct separate systems, the, the residual means-tested social assistance for the poor and then the private insurance for the middle class. So in, in the UK, for example, you find private pensions, uh, private health insurance, and, and all sorts of private insurances that the, for unemployment and so on that the middle class can buy into. And the, the, although the uh, social assistance is, is universal, it's on a very low level, basic pension, for example, in the UK is very low in uh, relative to other West European countries. So that's uh, the classic sort of explanation and the analysis that was carried out in the West. And then, of course, after the collapse of the communist system, the, com the transition to capitalism in the East and uh, socialist, ex socialist countries, uh, did big question arose, you know, what, what, was going, what was happening, what would happen there in terms of the development of these sorts of systems. Uh, would there be a residual social welfare system or would there be a more continental style social insurance system? And there's been some analysis of these uh, po so called post communist welfare regimes. And uh, Idu Kati, I think that's how you pronounce it, has been one of the leaders in this uh, literature and has uh, made a notable contribution. And what she identified was that um, the, uh, there is a distinct uh, post-communist welfare regime in which insurance-based schemes, social insurance, plays a major part in the social protection system. There's a high take-up of social security, but relatively low so social security benefits. And also, although there's increasing signs of liberalisation of social policy, meaning the private, private sector being involved, or privatisation, there's also a legacy of solidarity and universalism. So it's sort of a bit of a mixture of, of different regimes, different systems there. And so that's um, still a controversial sort of literature and is developing. And what I would like to do is just try to think about how this uh, applies in the case of the former Yugoslavia, because Yugoslavia was uh, also a communist system, but very different to the, as you know, uh, the systems behind the Iron Curtain, and much, much more liberal. And what did the, what did the uh, system of uh, welfare look like there? And where did, therefore, what was the basis for the current developments in social welfare? Um, well, uh, in developing the thesis of industrialization as, as a driver of uh, social welfare uh, of the welfare state. Theorists have drawn little distinction between capitalist and socialist forms of industrial society. In reality, the socialist countries which followed the Soviet model of central planning and state ownership developed more comprehensive welfare states than did the capitalist countries, with welfare grounded in strong commitment to full employment. The type of welfare state that emerged in former Yugoslavia was rather different from that behind the Iron Curtain. Since it did not make a commitment to full employment, even though employment rights were just as strong as in the other socialist countries, and many social benefits were linked to employment status. Titoist socialism also emphasised industrial development and had a strong commitment to social welfare based on social insurance principles, combined with universal health and education systems, inclusion of minorities and the provision of generous pensions and family benefits. The origins of social protection systems in, the, in Yugoslavia can be 
traced back to the pre-communist period in the former kingdom of Yugoslavia, during which a continental style of social insurance was established. The system covered a range of social risks, but excluded the participation of many social groups, including craftsmen, agricultural workers and peasants. Under the communist regime established after World War II, which followed on from that, the system of social insurance was retained and it's gradually extended as the industrial working class expanded. By 1965, almost half the population was covered by social insurance, compared to just over one-sixth before the Second World War. The system was supplemented by a range of non-contributory cash benefits, and benefits in kind, mostly available on a universal basis. It covered health insurance, disability insurance, pension entitlements and child allowances and was organised on a decentralised basis. With the exception of health insurance, which covered the entire population, the social insurance programmes covered only employees, while professionals such as lawyers, engineers and clergymen could access voluntary social insurance schemes. Self-employed persons, including farmers, were eligible to join one of the three voluntary social insurance schemes. The main contributory benefit was the pension, provided on the basis of age, invalidity or widowhood, at a level related to the contribution record of the beneficiary. The pension was relatively generous, and in the mid-1960s, male workers were eligible for a full pension at the age of 55, on condition of having worked for 35 years, while women, for women, the retirement age was 50, on condition of having worked for 30 years. Healthcare was also provided on a social insurance basis, and all the population was covered since workers' health contributions covered family members, and unemployed workers' health contributions were paid by the employment service. There's also a range of non-contributory cash benefits, including generous child allowance and other such family benefits. In addition, workers had extensive employment rights and job pr protection meant that dismissal from employment was rare, so relatively few were eligible for unemployment benefit, which was a very underdeveloped part of the welfare system. There were also various subsidies which supported uh, housing, subsidised holidays, subsidised transport, often provided by socially owned enterprises to their full-time employees. Uh, utilities such as heating and running water were subsidised. However, as in contemporary Greece, uh, by the beginning of the 1990s, the cost of providing such an extensive social welfare system had become unaffordable. And new legislation was introduced to reform the system, which involved a centralisation at the level of republics, just with, which happened just before the Yugoslavia broke up. And there were all sorts of uh, measures introduced in the 1980s, which was a period of economic crisis in Yugoslavia, which tried to rein in and cut back uh, the social benefits uh, to uh, try to introduce private participation in health uh, uh, prescriptions, for example, and, and various ways to try to cut back the costs of that. But that wasn't, that was, as, in, as it's been found in many countries, very difficult to, to cut back on these sorts of sis social systems. Um, and the solution was to borrow internationally, and there was a huge rise in international debt in former Yugoslavia. So by the end of the 1980s, the international debt of Yugoslavia stood at about $20 billion, which was enormous at that time. And that was one of the, I think, one of the contributory factors to the um, poor economic performance and the uh, conflicts between, between republics. Um, which could sort of spend independently, but they weren't responsible for the overall debt. So, a sort of similar dynamic to what we're seeing uh, happening today. Okay, so, um, so I'm not quite keeping up with myself with these things. Okay. Okay, so with the uh, with the transition. Uh, the collapse, following the collapse of Yugoslavia and the um, transition reforms that actually began before the breakdown of Yugoslavia. I've mentioned some of them, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. But the, 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 the breakup of Yugoslavia is one element of this story, but the, the transition reforms were a, 
ongoing in any case. Um, but they, uh, obviously that speeded things up because the new emerging states needed to develop their own policies towards social welfare. And the, uh, the, the initial uh, response for many times, a long time, is the is related to this issue of um, the sort of stickiness of social welfare systems and path dependency. It's very difficult to change the systems, and the systems didn't change dramatically, uh, and they were retained and, and modified in various forms. And perhaps the only exception to that was in the field of housing, where in most countries, and in new states, housing, along with privatisation of the, uh, in the company sector, the housing is also privatised, the social housing is privatised quite early on. Um, and uh, tenants were given the right to buy socially owned housing uh, at discounted prices in most of the uh, new ex-republics. In Croatia, for example, almost three quarters of the stock was sold under the law on the sale of apartments with protection for tenants who could not afford to buy their own apartments. Uh, in Macedonia, in the early 1990s, almost the whole social housing stock was sold under the law on the sale of apartments. Um, sorry, on the law on the sale of socially owned housing. Uh, in Albania, 98% of the housing stock was privatised. Uh, and in, in Serbia, similarly. Uh, and there's been a few studies done of this which show that, uh, in one study done in Serbia, show that very often this privatisation process is benefiting the uh, upper income groups who are able to buy into the most desirable housing, part of the housing stock. But I think that's a rather under-researched area and is, uh, is some, uh, an interesting topic. In the, uh, in the health sector, um, the, um, <coughs> the uh, privatisation partial privatisation in some parts of the health sector in some countries. So in Croatia and Macedonia, they were the first to introduce reforms to the health sector with um, privatisation in the primary care level. On the other hand, in many countries, including Bosnia, Serbia and Kosovo, the uh, okay, uh, similar reforms were introduced in Bosnia, Serbia and Kosovo, but a, a secondary care level in many countries, the, the uh, hospitals were nationalised, they were transferred to state ownership. Um, but because of uh, low levels of, of provision, a, a private sector has also emerged at secondary level and, and private hospitals uh, began to emerge. It's is a process which has perhaps gone furthest in Macedonia where private entrepreneurs have invested in new health facilities and in advanced medical equipment and technology in private hospitals. This has created a two-tiered hospital system composed of an over-politicised and inefficient public hospital system alongside a modern private hospital system that relies on out-of-pocket payments. And I don't know, you may, this may ring a bell for a cost of it as well, I don't know. Um, and, and in Albania. Okay, so essentially the... Um, the, the uh, evolution of the welfare state in ex Yugoslavia can be explained on the path dependency, although Kosovo is a special case, I'll come back to that. Um, Privatisation and de deindustrialisation um, and democratisation and the collapse of the middle class. And I'll deal with these, uh, these issues in turn. Okay, path dependency is probably the easiest one to think about. Um, we can trace the ways in which the um, welfare systems evolve over time and we can see that uh, in most cases the previous social insurance system was maintained and um, other aspects of the social welfare system apart from housing and some other elements uh, which I'll mention were retained, although the form has been modified over time. With, for the public pension systems, for example, 
pension rights being altered through parametric changes. Retirement ages have been increased, especially in the aftermath of the global economic crisis. Uh, and other parametric changes have reduced the generosity of pension schemes. But the, the pension sector is, is the pension systems are, are interesting because there's a, quite a wide variety of variation here. In some countries, new, entirely new privatised pension schemes have been introduced. Uh, for example, in uh, Croatia and Macedonia, uh, new three a new second pillar of the private of the pension system has been introduced based on private pension contributions, which build up a, a uh, an accumulated fund, which uh, is used as a basis for paying private pensions when a person retires. So it's meant to be moving from away away from the pay as you go system towards a fully funded system, and that's uh, the World Bank has been very active in promoting that. And that was taken up in Croatia and in Macedonia. And I said a uh, special case of Kosovo, what does this mean? Well, as in the, unlike in, in the other ex uh, Yugoslav republics and in Albania, or maybe Albania is also a bit of an exception in a way, but we'll talk about that. Um, this legacy of the past and this past dependency was interrupted dramatically by the 1999 war. Uh, after which the um, and, and also during the 1990s of course when the uh, Milosevic regime dismissed uh, many of the uh, Albanian community from their jobs and they therefore lost this connection to these social insurance rights um, and also because of the collapse of the social insurance system on that because of that reason but also because social insurance records were lost in 1999, the situation was a sort of rather sort of clean slate. It was, it was a, an interruption from the previous system. A new, entirely new system had to be developed from scratch. And in the um, uh, pension area, the, uh, a, a new private pension system was developed, uh, which uh, was quite remarkable, really, because uh, What's happened there is that the the private the contributions of the to the pension fund, the new private pension fund, have been in, invested entirely in uh, commercial funds abroad. Uh, they initially in in, in Belgium, in a, the ABN Amro Bank in Belgium, uh, which subs in uh, each contributor had a, a personal account, <laughs> and the contributions were invested in a a uh, share account, share holding and uh, investment account in, in this bank. And with the onset of the, in the financial crisis, of course, share values throughout the world collapsed and the value of this pension fund similarly collapsed. Not only that, but the European AMRO Bank was taken over by the Royal Bank of Scotland, which was one of the banks which was most involved in this excessive uh, lending and financial innovation globally, and which went bankrupt basically, and uh, in, 19, in uh, 2009, and had to be rescued by the British government with a massive infusion of billions of uh, pounds. So it was essentially nationalised. So I guess now the, the British government is the owner of the Kosovo private pension fund, <laughs> which I think has recovered a little bit of its value, but. Is still uh, essentially not very, doesn't look very good as an investment. Um, so that's uh, what's going on there. And um, the, uh, we can look at all the different dimensions of the welfare system to see how, how it's evolved over time. They said that's a sort of gradual change story, but a couple of other things have happened that have brought about some more dramatic changes. Firstly, if you remember, I said at the beginning that one of the drivers of the welfare state, the development of the welfare state, was the growth of the industrial society. But what's happened in transition in the Western Balkans has been a process of deindustrialization. Many people have lost their jobs and their connection to employment. And um, 
This has thrown the development of the welfare state in these countries into reverse. Unemployment has increased, and at the same time, employment rates have fallen. Reduced rates of labour force participation reflect not only discouraged worker effects, but also the reversion to a more patriarchal cultural patterns of social interaction and the return to a more traditional role for women within the family. Under transition, therefore, some welfare measures were abandoned as deindustrialisation took hold. One early casualty was the system of family benefits, such as free kindergartens, which had often been linked to enterprises and which disappeared when the enterprises were privatised. Unemployment, especially high youth unemployment, encouraged migration, which became a widely used means of avoiding poverty in both Yugoslav successor states and for the first time in Albania. The large inflow of remittances, which we discussed yesterday, uh, which these emigrants often sent home, often exceeded the formal social assistance transfers to the poorest sections of the community and became a sort of informal substitute for social welfare. The structure of the economy and of social and class composition also changed as transition progressed. Large-scale structural change and privatisation, combined with wars and conflicts, involved the collapse and physical destruction of much of the old industrial base, and with it the loss of employment attached to protected jobs. New jobs were created mainly in the emerging service sector, in small and medium-sized firms in which workers were unable to defend their employment rights, and in which job-related welfare entitlements were unheard of and in the informal sector, where even the traditional social insurance element was absent. The residual public sector remained the sole source of protected permanent employment, but became highly politicised, and turnover of personnel in response to changes in government and political affiliation became common. Eventually, even a public sector job was not entirely secure. <coughs> As in the former socialist system, trade unions were weak or absent, and failed to organise strongly to defend inherited welfare rights. Unemployment increased, and the system in which unemployment benefits were minimal, even though unemployment was not a new phenomenon, persisted. As unemployment increased, the social basis of the old welfare system was gradually undermined. So you can see that although there was past dependency and this sort of legacy of the past, gradually over time, as the transition began to work its way through, the social insurance systems became less and less viable as the link to employment was severed. You can see this most particularly in the pension systems, where the ratio between full-time employees and pensioners is becoming more and more unfavourable. And the pension systems, the public pension systems, are becoming more and more difficult to finance and, and more and more problematic. And you can see there's also another form, other elements of the, uh, the welfare system. Okay. Okay. The, well, the second. Um, main sort of driver of um, welfare change, welfare system change, as well as the industrialization, deindustrialization, was the, and which worked in the opposite direction in a way, was the uh, transition to democracy, the democratization of the countries. Because this meant that um, the uh, new political constituencies came into play. And just as with the, the way the, the end, in French, widening of the franchise in the early industrial countries drove the development of the welfare state. So now in the Western Balkans, these new political constituencies, new political power bases are having a new voice in driving the uh, political decisions about what the welfare state should look like. And the specific um, social groups which politicians have to pay attention to, in particular are the war veterans and the pensioners. These two groups seem to mobilise politically in support, in, in pressuring for their, 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 their support through their welfare system. Um, other newly enfranchised political constituencies included the unemployed and the urban professional elite, uh, perhaps less vocal. Um, and the welfare of refugees and um, displaced persons became an important issue, although these groups have been much less successful in exerting political influence. The situation and living conditions of ethnic minority groups, such as the Roma, also dramatically deteriorated in some countries, although again they have little political voice. But most importantly, perhaps under the transition, the position of the middle class declined 
and policies such as education and lifelong learning took a back seat, leading to a decline in education and expenditure and performance. Migration also led to a brain drain of the most highly educated, reducing the political support of the middle class for universal benefits. Therefore, in, in the uh, field of social assistance programs, cate so-called categorical benefits tended to dominate, reflecting the political power of the more powerful sectional interest groups, such as war veterans, pensioners, and the politicized public sector, where access to a formal job often depends on political affiliation. And public sector jobs became an instrument of social policy and a means of redistributing wealth. So I think the most important point to take out of this is that um, the, you know, the, the decline of the, the middle class and the, and the rise of powerful sectional interest groups such as the war veterans and the pensioners led to lack of, a, a drop in support or a, a lack of support for the sort of reforms that the World Bank is proposing, sort of targeted uh, social assistance, non-contributory social assistance to the poor in society. Okay, so despite the introduction of democracy, there were few political forces with an interest or a desire to protect or preserve the former welfare system. Often it seemed that only the force of inertia held it together in the face of the development of new social risks and new pressures for change. The forces which promoted change included prominently the various international donor organisations, which assumed a powerful role in the policy formation in most countries. However, their influence is limited by a relative lack of coordination and different approaches to policy transfer, leading to a relatively inconsistent reform agenda. Since multiple strategies were developed with conflicting aims and objectives, it is hardly surprising that implementation proved to be a major weakness. This led to the appearance of weak administrative capacity, which in many cases reflected more the proliferation of conflicting advice and policy inconsistency as much as lack of technical skills or expertise. <coughs> Thus, international advisors everywhere became a prime influence on the nature of welfare state reforms. And the, the prime example of that really is in the pension field. Or one, is, I mean, it's, it, you can see the example in all fields, and in the World Bank now and social assistance, but up to now, the, the most important element, aspect of that has been pension reforms, where the World Bank has been driving the, these private pension <laughs> systems. Um, another prime influence uh, was the nature of political alliances that were formed in the aftermath of different patterns of transition and conflict which uh, beset the various countries of the region. In several countries, the middle class was either not previously formed, such as Albania, Kosovo and Macedonia, or was much reduced in size, Serbia, Bosnia and Montenegro, due to the migration of skilled professionals and to the economic collapse and inflation during the 1990s. Perhaps only in Croatia was a sizable middle class preserved which could form a political coalition with other forces. However, and well, as an example of that, in Serbia, the Minister of Labour and Social Policy, Rasim Ljajic, recently commented that the most, people, most people who are not rich in Serbia today are in some way poor, and that the entire middle class category is gone. So, what then were the sources of support for new non-contributory social assistance schemes in the Western Balkans? Despite the growth of mass unemployment and poverty, no countries have introduced social assistance schemes that have been anything other than residual means-tested schemes with little, little impact on policy, um, on, on poverty reduction. Um, and the World Bank has been doing, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of research on this, looking at household surveys. And they've come to the conclusion, looking at these, many, many of these surveys, that um, the, this, these uh, social assistance schemes are indeed, in most cases, apart from Bosnia, quite well targeted. And actually, the Kosovo scheme is the best targeted. But the coverage is very low. In other words, not very many people get it although it might sort of reach the poor, it didn't reach many of them. Um, 
from reform, but I don't I think we've got time for that. This interesting story about who, who, right, who, who are the people who are resisting reforms? Is it the, the losers from the transition process? In which case you can buy them off by include, introducing social assistance schemes or social security schemes as one view. The other view is actually, no, it's not the losers of reform which are the, the losers from transition which are the main resistance to reform. It's the winners from transition who are providing the main resistance to reform. And the idea of partial reform, that reforms go a certain, direct, a certain distance and then they stop because the new partially reformed system has actually created a new set of quasi-rents, that's where rent seeking comes in to the story, that uh, new monopolies are formed, new privileges are formed at that point. The new elite doesn't want to carry on reforming any further, it's quite happy with where it is and, and stops. So that's another sort of reason for this sort of slowness of, of the reforms, apart from the, the path dependency and the, so on. Um, Okay, so coalition politics, poverty and, and social assistance. Um, yes, I was talking about the World Bank there, and okay, um, in all Western Balkan countries, and the conclusion in that research is that there are var variations in targeting efficiency, and coverage tends to be lower as does the generosity of benefits to people other than war veterans and their families. This reflects the fact that poor, the poor have little political influence. And it contrasts with the case of the pensioners who have formed their own political parties in Croatia and Serbia to defend their interests in the face of pressures to reduce the level of benefits and entitlements of the pension system. The veterans' interest has also been a driving force for a particular model of social benefits in post-conflict countries, such as Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia, where the strong political influence of veterans' associations has encouraged the development of social assistance in the form of categorical benefits, um, which is only weakly targeted to the poor. And there's an interesting story recently in Bosnia that the, the war veterans in the Republic of Srpska are uh, uniting with the war veterans in the, the Federation in order to defend their benefits against the uh, austerity program, which is being introduced uh, by the Bosnian government at the behest of the IMF. Okay. Okay. So, um, is there some data available on the, the outcomes of this? What are the, what, what's the sort of financial size of the welfare systems? What's the, what's the level of social spending? And what this shows basically is that um, they, uh, compared to the EU27, gross social spending as a percentage of GDP in all the Western Balkans is far lower. Um, so the, you know, the story about governments spending being too high in places like Croatia and, and Serbia and Bosnia is, you know, take it with a pinch of salt when you compare it to the EU27. So for example, in EU27, general government expenditure as a percentage of GDP is 51%, whereas in Bosnia and Herzegovina it's 43%. So it's already significantly lower than in the EU. Uh, and whereas social benefits as a percentage of GDP in the EU27 are 29.5%, in <coughs> Serbia, the, which is the highest spender, social benefits are 19.7%. So it's significantly, again, 10 percentage points lower than in the EU already. And uh, although cuts are being uh, demanded, uh, further cuts are being demanded. Um, the, um, but within the uh, region, within this group of countries, you can identify distinct difference between countries which are high spenders on social benefits, social <coughs> protection, and countries which are low spenders. And you can see that uh, Croatia and Serbia, for example, are the prime examples of high spenders, uh, whereas Albania and Kosovo and to some extent Macedonia, although the data is not good, uh, are the low spenders. And um, so 
what this implies is that the the pace of change of previous of, of the inherited social welfare system has been much slower in Croatia and Serbia than it has elsewhere, and these have retained this continental European style model of social welfare, uh, albeit in a sort of post-communist uh, type of uh, uh, format. Uh, whereas the uh, welfare systems in Kosovo and Albania are completely different. They are very based on very low levels of public expenditure and very high reliance on private participation in provision of, of welfare. Uh, and these are really new types of welfare regimes, uh, possibly could be classified as Balkan welfare regimes, but perhaps more similar to the Anglo-Saxon liberal welfare regimes. Hyper-liberalism is a term which has been recently coined by Mario Nucci, and I think the term hyper-liberalism, hyper-liberal systems, applies quite neatly to Kosovo, Albania and Macedonia, which seems to be moving in that direction. And if you look at what's going on in Macedonia now, you see that with the reduction in public expenditure, albeit with the investment in monuments, is, uh, is, is quite noticeable. Uh, based on the introduction of flat ta income tax, 10% income tax, and the creation of a set of industrial zones which are trying to attract foreign investment, based, which, are, which are rely on a 0% profits tax, uh, for foreign invest well, for foreign investors basically, uh, zero percent profit tax, uh, ninety nine year leases for free, and a half a million euro subsidy if you build a factory. So not surprising that actually Macedonia is the only country in the region which is still attracting foreign investment. Perhaps Montenegro. A few several new factories have been established in these zones. Uh, Macedonia advertises itself as the country with the lowest labour costs in Europe. Um, and it seems to be positioning itself as a sort of onshore tax haven. So um, that's a very a sort of interesting new development, but it's sort of all linked in, I think, with the, the approach to social welfare. And what we can also notice is um, distinct responses in the way that countries have uh, responded to the ec global economic crisis and the Eurozone crisis, uh, knock on effects. Uh, for example, in Croatia, you can see the introduction of an austerity program, which has resulted in four years of economic recession. In Serbia, you can see an attempt to carry on as before, uh, with high levels of public expenditure, spending their way out of recession, with accompanied by a depreciation of the currency. And in Macedonia, you can see this uh, of attempt to introduce domestic internal devaluation and, um, and, and to improve competitiveness on the basis of tax competition. But none of these, uh, none of these different models have actually worked in terms of defending the countries against the impact of the economic crisis because all three of those countries have, in 2012, in this year, have seen a, uh, a collapse in their economies and uh, a new recession with negative rates of GDP growth in the first half of the year, and probably worse to come. Okay, so uh, that's the that's the data. Okay, so um, yeah, this is, these are the policy conclusions. Then um, okay, most of the Western Balkan regimes seem to be some sort of variety of post-communist welfare regimes, although it's not really very well defined, uh, with a distinction between the sort of northern countries, which are much more like along the continental model, uh, or limited that, and the, uh, the southern countries, which are more in this sort of liberal dimension. Uh, the drivers of change, in order to understand what's going on, you, you need to understand that the drivers of change differ from that in the West, especially with uh, Deindustrialisation and tradition traditionalisation leading to a retrenchment of the welfare state and cut back in the cuts of the what was inherited from the Yugoslav system and the 
through this Albanian system. Uh, and then democratization with interest group capture. So although you've got this opposite, this sort of positive element of new social groups being enfranchised, there's very specific social groups. And you've had to collapse the middle class. So you haven't got this middle class buy-in to the new, any new sort of social welfare system. And so there's no political support, for example, for um, these sort of uh, uh, targeted uh, means-tested benefit systems which the World Bank is uh, trying to propose. Um, and so what's the way forward? Well, possibly um, there might be, what you have to think, what, where, are the, where is the political support for new welfare systems? Where is the political support for the defence of uh, incomes of the, the poor? It's clearly not from the poor themselves. So it has to be more wide, wider than that. And it might be a long dimension of some sort of universal child allowance, especially in view of the ageing populations in some countries, apart from Kosovo and Albania, um, which uh, might be uh, acceptable and attractive to wide sections of the population, uh, and improve vocational and uh, education tra and training programmes which raise skills and skills are linked to higher incomes and that might also have sort of wider appeal than uh, income transfers to the poorest uh, alone. Thank you very much, Will. Um, I would like to open up the discussion to the floor now. We are running a tad late, as per usual, and we've got a very tight schedule today, so I think we should really resume at um, 11 o'clock on the dot for the next panel. So I think I would allow some 15 minutes for discussion and then a fairly curtailed break. So, if there's any questions. Thank you very much for this highly interesting uh, contribution. Um, could you please uh, elaborate a bit about the difference between the uh, high social benefit uh, system and the low social benefit system? How, how come that there's uh, such big differences between on the one side, say, Croatia and, and Serbia, and uh, on the other side, you mentioned Albania and Kosovo as examples. Um, what are the, the political dynamics behind that in, in, in say, in Serbia, uh, it's, it's a higher level than, say, in, in Albania or in Kosovo. Uh, what is the, the driving force behind? Is Sorry, Klaus, would you kindly introduce yourself? Just for the uh, Klaus Giesen, University of Auvergne, France. Uh, well, I think, as, as I explained, the, um, the main differences are to do with the um, issue of in, industri industrialization and employment. Um, Croatia and, and Serbia have, especially Croatia, has managed to sort of maintain formal sector employment, uh, and so has Serbia, the late transition, although that is now, the last two or three years in Serbia, you know, 200,000 jobs have been lost, so they're sort of entering into that problem now. But in Albania, the, industri the industrial base collapsed. Um, although Albania is a different case really because they actually introduced social insurance rather than uh, being just uh, continuing with it. But this has a very quite limited coverage actually, which is why there's um, a very small, very low social expenditure in total for Albania. Uh, and Macedonia also um, collapse of the old industrial sector is extremely high unemployment. I mean, unemployment in Macedonia is, uh, has reached a, a height of 32% uh, or something like that uh, before the crisis. And it's actually interesting that Macedonia is the only country where unemployment has actually fallen during the crisis. In all the other countries, unemployment has increased quite dramatically. In, in Serbia from 13% in 2008 to 25% now, so it's sort of doubled. Um, and so, but apart from that, I think it's, um, yeah, I think you can see that, that distinction, that the old formal sector employment 
based around industry was sort of preserved in those high spending countries where it's collapsed in the low spending countries. And then the, um, the issue is the sort of political, the democratization and the creation, the, the development of political coalitions for public uh, expenditure. You can see in, in Croatia and Serbia have developed these pensionist parties which have been quite strong. Uh, whereas there are no such parties, as far as I know, in, in the other countries. Uh, and another dimension is the, whether you have a political system which is based around coalitions or based around two-party systems. And you can see that it seems to correlate with the pension reform uh, pattern. So you have Croatia and Macedonia, essentially two-party systems. And then you have uh, Serbia, um, Bosnia, I guess, with more sort of coalitional politics, where it's more difficult, more veto points, so it's more difficult to introduce these sort of reforms. So that's another sort of uh, reason for, or cause for persistence in the whole type of social welfare system. Is there any change where you've got a more you know, dual political system where you have one party get coming to power and it's actually able to force through change. You know, the HDZ in Croatia for 10 years and you had an interregnum with the SPB uh, Socialist Party for a few years but then the HDZ came back to power for another 10 years. So they were sort of strongly there and they were able to introduce pension reforms and other types of systemic reforms much more easily than in Serbia where you had coalition politics after 2000 with sort of relatively uh, you know, weak governments in relation to that issue. Um, first, I've got two points. One is, of course, in S.B. Anderson's argument, the role of the Scandinavian model were the trade unions, and then they're the ones who form the coalition. Um, whereas in the continental model, you, it's nativism. It's, you know, when Bismarck came reforms after the French Prussian War and the French, you know, losses. They want to increase um, the population. And I'm a little surprised, actually, though I should, shouldn't be, because, but I'm a little surprised that you haven't had the latter developing in the Balkans. So I'm so curious about whether you think that, as a part of the still ongoing um, nationalist movement, you might get some discussion of that. And then the, the second, and this is really, Fred is knows more about this than I do, but I was thinking about what, what do you think about the role of what Paul Stubbs talks about in Bosnia-Herzegovina? That is to say that wartime assistance, and this would be the South, of course, mainly, wartime assist, international assistance um, are, uh, it defines categories of victims, minorities, not the general population. So it's not universalist first. Um, and secondly, that then in his argument, as you know, um, these assistance, these, these people, the foreign assistance people, um, humanitarian workers, recycle themselves as development people and they undercut the, the social welfare institutions in the cities. And so the people who could be do, defining it differently and, and have the skills from the pre war system um, are the, the donor money goes to the private systems and, and these external actors. Do you, do you think that's just a kind of minor ripple on the story you're taking, telling, or do you think there's something more important in some of the cases? Okay, that's uh, good questions. Um, I think the... Um, should have written down what the first one was. What was the first one? Versus All right, okay, yeah, the continent. Yeah, uh, maybe I didn't explain it properly, but the, um, my idea is that the... Um, in, ex, you know, in, in, in successor states, you actually do have this Bismarckian system because it was in, inherited from former you know, Titoist socialism, which was in turn inherited from the pre war Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which was sort of partly part of the sort of the northern part was, came out of the Austro Hungarian system and the German system. So, as you were explaining, I think somebody was telling um, yesterday. So we had this sort of, you can trace through this Bismarckian social insurance system all the way through, and it was retained. And, uh, and yeah, um, weak trade unions 
is the reason you don't get to the Scandinavian model. There are no alliance between workers and middle class as you have in Scandinavia. In the Bismarckian continental system, that was based around the idea of actually trying to defuse the socialist parties by introducing these social insurance protections for fully workers in full employment. I mean, uh, but without any sort of levelling, the social insurance system re reproduces the inequalities within or the wage dis within the wage distribution. So your benefits are related to the income you have in work. Um, that's how, that, how, how it works. So that's, uh, that's con continued and that is in place in, the, in these northern countries and not so much in the southern countries where you have, in Albania, you, you don't have that, for example. Uh, at least not, not, for, not for a very broad proportion of the population. Um, and then the, um, the, the question of the international donor organisations, international actors in aid workers and so on, I think that's a sort of inter very interesting question, but I think that on the one hand they had very huge influence, on the other hand it's you shouldn't really overstate the influence because um, I think what's happening is that the domestic politicians are actually very good at manipulating the donors and uh, Rather, although the donors have a, a in some cases a, are influential, in other cases they, because of you have m many donors, sort of multiple principles and one agent, if you like, many donors and, and one government, then the government can play off the donors against each other, and so you get this policy inconsistency. I think that's the main effect of it, uh, and you get the appearance of lack of administrative capacity, and uh, so on. So. But it's not really a lack of administrative capacity, it's actually quite high level of administrative capacity to play off donors against each other. And uh, that's a sort of you know, reproduction of the old sort of Yugoslav model of playing the East off against the West you know, to, to, to get um, loans. So, but in order to do this game where they're, they're playing off the donors, they obviously they have to sort of give something back, and what they give back is some policy reforms. That they're, going to, they're giving one set of policy reforms to one group of donors and another set of policy reforms to another group of donors. So you get this inconsistency and you get these sort of strange hybrid welfare systems which don't quite correspond to the continental model or the Scandinavian model or the, any other model, but they sort of emerge as these strange, confusing things which you can't quite understand and, and, and categorise them. Right, and then James? Hi, Fred Kukazala from uh, St. John's. Uh, and I want to sort of respond by defending, um, first defending corruption, and then defending the damage that NGOs can do. <laughs> um, and I think part of this, um, one thing that I saw looking at the, the implementation of a very liberal system, as you say, Kosovo, was that on the ground it could become very corporatist when it was corrupted. And in some places like, like Skender, it becomes nearly universal and more effective at combating poverty, but deeply tied to the political party and power. And because you get this, it becomes almost, you get almost corporatist, like it was this Markian sort of national party, you know, national uh, welfare system. And I think you might see some of that in the veterans movements as a kind of way to get almost this Markian. And then the, the defending the, the the damage that NGOs can do, um, in a sense, I think because, especially in Kosovo, where there was so much emphasis on rebuilding in other ways, and as you said, that you can you can sort of sell off the, the donors by applying some some areas of reform, and I think social welfare is one that is particularly cheap for local elites to sell off, and I think that's why you got so much. Um, NGO dominance in terms of, especially in Kosovo, right, where I mean the, the categories of relief um, were essentially the exact same categories of UNHCR distribution. Um, we just switched them from from being refugee benefits to becoming social welfare benefits. 
um, right down to the point of you know initially coming with a basket of food that was part of the initial you know benefit for category one, um, but not for category two. Okay, so it, you, there is so much hold over there, and I think like you're saying, part of this, it's um it's it's easily neglected in the rush of post conflict reconstruction. You don't think of rebuilding welfare systems, and so I think it got sold off cheap. Uh, I guess the last point is about the unions, which is also the sort of cleaning the slate in Kosovo. Um, there, there were unions here, and you know they, you know, meeting with the guys there, and they were so easily pushed aside. And they give part of this, you folks are this as is pointed out that this process of deindustrialization and lack of industrialization in that reflects a demographic side. Um, the guys in the unions were older, and there were fewer of them than the massive numbers of young NGO workers. And when you figure the, the tremendous number of, of people entering the force who had no relationship to any previous welfare system in some place like Kosovo. And so it was very easily politically put the, the, the EPRK, they just pushed them aside very quickly. Um, but they did try. <laughs> they were not at the door, but they're internationally, there's no one to defend them. Only the ILO, which was involved in vocational training and not reaching out to local unions. Yeah, thanks. Would you like to answer the question? Uh, no, I guess it wasn't a question, it was a statement. All right, then. All right. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, it's very interesting. Um, thank you very much for that. That's, that's great. That's great. Sorry, I think Jeremy points. hooked himself in first. I think he's Sorry, we'll, we'll take your question, Justin. Hi, uh, James Corovidis. Um, <laughs> Really? It's a business school, again. <laughs> right. um, really, it, it's a relatively um, brief question, but um, as you could imagine, I'm, I'm sort of curious about this relationship between remittances and, and welfare. Because on the one hand, I can see that if you um, don't provide appropriate welfare systems, then the incentive to migrate and send remittances is huge. and Remittances and, and migration are, are associated with various sort of negative effects on society and the economy, brain drain, loss of skill, work, all, all those sort of things. Um, uh, but, but at the same time, I can see that sort of remittances, from the government's point of view, can represent something of a trap because if remittances are coming in, on the one hand, it means that you don't have to be under such a huge obligation to provide appropriate welfare. And on the other hand, you're, you're getting revenues from those remittances. You, you can tax the goods which are then bought with those remittances, you know, even if you can't tax the remittances directly. You know, so I'm just wondering whether, whether you think that that's you know, largely behind what's happening in Kosovo and Albania, you know, whether the urge for the impetus for government to actually take on the task of providing welfare reform or addressing the shortcomings of the welfare system are you know, removed by the, the availability of remittances. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I think as it's, uh, you know, to um, mention remittances as a sort of informal welfare system. And I think yesterday the, the paper which was looking at the household survey data <coughs> show quite clearly that the, the poorer households benefit proportionately more from remittances. You know, it covers increases their consumption significantly rather than the richer ones, or there may be hidden remittances to the richer sections. But um, so that's that's one aspect of it. It's a sort of informal welfare, and clearly, to the extent that it substitutes for government's provision of welfare programmes, then it is. It, it, my point is that you know th what were the drivers of um, welfare state? One is deindustrialization, and the other is democratization. Just simply put, really, um, the deindustrialization is one aspect that's driving people abroad because there are no jobs at home, and they're going to work abroad and they're sending money back home. So that's that. And 
the, the um, democratization aspect is showing with migration that, as uh, I pointed out, that many of the highly skilled middle class people are migrating. So that reduces the, the middle class pressure for uh, <coughs> that, the, the type of um, systematic universal welfare system which could address poverty in a um, <coughs> fundamental way. So, because I think what the, what the work of S. V. Anderson shows is that you need you need broad political coalitions to to drive through welfare reforms because they involve, they involve transfers from one section of the population to another. <coughs> and generally speaking, <coughs> the <coughs> poorer poorer sections of the population don't have the political clout to do that. They need allies. So they need allies from the middle class, they need allies from the peasants. That's how it's happened historically. And uh, yeah, so and then there's the issue of the workers' movement, how powerful that is, but as somebody said, Fred said, the uh, and as I, I agree with the trade unions are marginalised. I mean, they do well, yeah, they exist, but they're weak. Uh, so you can't see any political constituency for for reform and remittances and migration are part of that. It reduces it's caused by deindustrialization and it reduces the democratic uh, pressure for reform and welfare. So Justin, this will have to be the last question due to time constraints. Um, yes, Justin Elliott, uh, University College London, School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Um, my question was very closely related um, to, to James's, uh, in that uh, I wanted to think about the difference between Croatia and Serbia, and particularly Kosovo, in that in Kosovo, the large household survived uh, in very much larger proportions than it did in early housing Croatia or uh, Serbia. And that means that there is uh, an obligation on behalf of the wealthier members of that household, and that includes people who are abroad, it may include people who got uh, nice jobs in the cities to, uh, to uh, put into the um, uh, to the uh, to help with the poorer members of the household, um, and it's that part of traditionalisation, that part of traditionalism, that also is perhaps another factor in uh, in in making that difference in providing a sort of informal welfare system. And uh, following on from Susan Woodward's uh, point about. Um, natalism and uh, nationalism. I wonder what you thought of, for example, the, uh, the phenomenon in southern Serbia, uh, where there is a large amount of uh, depopula uh, um, uh, loss of population, where it's, you now have the phenomenon of Serbian men taking wives from Albania in order to um, uh, in, in in order to maintain and increase the population. Okay, thanks. It's a very interesting comment, and uh, it's a very important question: uh, the question of the, the family and the extended family, and the issue of re-traditionalisation and the role of women okay, in the new societies. And in the the, the, the way that the welfare state affects women and the way the physical influence of women affects the welfare state. And I think the, um, what's noticeable is that what's in the data on employment, um, you see this huge increase in unemployment. But alongside that, you also see a dramatic drop in the participation rate, an uh, increase in inactivity. And the, the, you know, the, the EU 2020 target for the employment rate, that's the proportion of the working age population in employment, is uh, 
75%. And the typical employment rate in the Western Balkans is 45%. But then if you break that down by gender, you see that the male employment rate is more like 60%, and the female employment rate is more like 30%. And if you compare that to what the situation was in former Yugoslavia, where women were very much integrated into the labor force, you can see that that's really been a very dramatic change. And there's this been this sort of pushing back of women into the family. And that's where this re-traditionalization and the, the development of the in sort of new patriarchal societies comes in. And I think that happens in, in all of the countries, in, including Kosovo. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not an expert by any means, I don't know. But uh, my feeling, I mean, I've, I've been, I came here in 1987 the first time I came here. And I did a research project on the labour market in Kosovo. So I was able to sort of see what it was like before the transition. And I came in 1999, immediately after the war, to do some teaching and subsequently something. So I've sort of seen things now and read about it and so on. So um, my feeling is that even here there's been a sort of re-traditionalisation. Um, but certainly in a place like Serbia you can see it very dramatically, the, the changing in the role of women in society and uh, the reversion to a patriarchal society. You know, and that's sort of probably what your ref reflection of what you're talking about in southern Serbia. And that all has an impact on the, the type of politics which you know, emerges in relation to welfare issues. And I think perhaps I didn't quite get what Susan was saying before about pro naturalism, didn't quite catch that. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's um, I think actually potentially, what I'm suggesting here is it's actually potentially a powerful generator of bringing back family benefits and so on. I mean, that's all very sort of touchy subject, really. And in Croatia, there are various sort of uh, family benefits, not a discussion about, you know, how many children are going to get the child allowance and what size of family. Do you, do you get extra for more? Do you get actually bonus points if you have more than three or <laughs> whatever? So, or is it actually then, you know, it becomes too expensive and you have to sort of cut back and so on.